At She Can, we tell women's stories. We describe how women got to where they are today by having really interesting, inspirational and motivational conversations with women from all over the world. And I'm so delighted to talk to Dr. Andrea Austin today. Andrea, welcome to She Can. You are an emergency doctor, a coach and an educator. You write, you teach and you research on how to create more change makers in healthcare. You deeply care about the well-being of physicians who look after people. You wrote a book with the title Revitalized, a guidebook to rediscovering your hardline while doctoring, which is coming out in September, I believe. And you also um, run a podcast, Revitalizing Healthcare. You coach healthcare workers, and you're a very outspoken leader in the healthcare revitalization. Tell us a bit more about yourself. Well, thank you so much for that warm introduction. So I'm an emergency doctor. I grew up in a really small town and there wasn't a lot of exposure to various career paths. Um, my dad was a police officer. My mom was a social worker and I became interested in healthcare. And I had a lot of great mentorship and I began shadowing a physician assistant in my hometown and the nurse that worked for her said, you should be a doctor. You know, you're finding this when you're young enough, uh, you've got time, go for it. And that really stuck with me. So I went to medical school, became an emergency doctor, and I was worried about student debt, honestly. And I was also really drawn to service. So I uh, took a military scholarship, served in the United States Navy until 2020. And they, they did pay for my medical school. And during that time, I deployed to Iraq. Um, and that was a very impactful experience. I always tell people that being in the military made me a better person, doctor and citizen. And I believe you're you're in the UK. And I actually worked with a, a British doctor um, while I was deployed. And then I came home and a couple of years later was the pandemic. Um, so my emergency medicine career has been punctuated, shall we say, um, by a lot of really intense, um, honestly, traumatic experiences. And I almost left emergency medicine um, during the pandemic 2021. I really hit a low point, like many healthcare professionals. Yeah. And I knew that I had given so much to become a doctor and I was a really good doctor and there had to be a better way. So the book is really my story of rebuilding myself, rebuilding a way forward on how to work in what is honestly a really dysfunctional system. Yeah. And it breaks my heart that so many healthcare professionals are leaving um, and the ones that are staying um, don't feel valued or appreciated and don't have safe working conditions. So I hope the book um, helps people put on their oxygen mask. And as more of us do that, we can change the system. Andrea, you have a really big vision and a really big mission. And I really love that because I think it shows us that we too can have very big visions and you're working towards uh, doing your part in fixing a system that is broken. And I think there is a lot of people talking about it, especially in terms of um, women's related, uh, um, you know, health fields. So there is, we are really under-researched, we're underfunded, and the whole healthcare system in most parts of the world is really um, broken. And so I would love to delve into that topic a little bit more before we come back to you and hear more about how your experiences were and what they taught you and how you're now giving back uh, through your experiences, some kind of, a, I don't want to call it a burnout, but it sounds like that might have been a sort of burnout that you then, um, from that moment on, you, 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 something in you changed and you really thought, I need to be supportive and I need to help other physicians 
who are in a similar position. And so you wrote the book, you're doing the podcast, you do so much great work around that. So tell us a little bit more about the system that you're a part of and why it is so broken. Wow. Um, do we have all day? Um, I'll try to give you the, the short, the short story. I love a version. <laughs> Um, I think one message I really want everyone to hear, and, and I know you have an international audience, a lot of times people in the United States will say, well, healthcare is broken here mm. because we don't have universal healthcare like many countries yeah. in Europe or Canada or Australia. Well, I talk with doctors from all of those countries. And when we look at the burnout numbers um, in, for healthcare professionals in other countries, they're similar yeah. to the United States. So no system is doing a great job by their patients or their doctors. Yeah. I honestly know the US system the best, so I'll, I'll speak from that. But I wanted to make sure that it was clear to your audience that this is a universal problem. Definitely. When we look at the United States, half of patients um, are very dissatisfied with their care and, and do not think that they get good care. And when I talk to family members and friends that are non-medical and, and they know I'm a doctor, sometimes they say things like, I hate my doctor, or my doctor doesn't listen to me, or I can't get into a doctor. And I hear that from my patients all the time. You know, I now ask in the emergency department, if I send you home, when's the next time you can see a doctor? And a lot of times the, the look is just defeat. And they say, I don't know, maybe six weeks, maybe eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And this is just crazy given that all the countries I've listed, we could do this better. The resources are there to take better care of people. You know, one statistic from the United States is less than 10% of our healthcare do dollars go to preventative care. Yeah. And we know that prevention is the best medicine. So one of the reasons our emergency departments are so overcrowded is we're not going upstream. We're not investing in the health of our communities. And so people come to the emergency department in extremis at the very end when they're having their heart attack or stroke or whatever it may be um, because we're not really taking care of our patients. And, and my premise also is this is what happens when we have a system that doesn't take care of the workers. And how are we going to do the monumental work that's needed to rebuild a system when we have doctors that are sleep deprived? You know, I have so many colleagues that have shared stories of crashing their cars or nearly crashing their cars on the way home from sleep deprivation. Yeah. And how are you going to have the energy to rebuild the system and have the hard conversations and the clarity? When we have doctors that are sleep deprived, that don't have access to nutritious food in the hospital, mm -hmm. um, and don't have support um, when they're doing this really hard work. And, and worse than that, sometimes when we ask for help, um, we're told that we're defective, um, we're placed on administrative leave, we're mm -hmm. referred to programs that are more punitive than truly helpful. Um, so like any other industry, you know, you've got to treat the people, the frontline people, people in your organization well, and when you don't, we cannot expect wonderful outcomes. Yeah, I'm very thankful for everything you said. And we, we, we do live with a sick care system rather than a health care system. I think that is a global um, fact. So Andrea, tell us a little bit more about the amazing work you do. What is your main motivator? What are you trying to achieve? You know, it's funny, about three years ago when I left, let's say I left the military in, in 2020 and I started down this journey of figuring out what is it that I do as, as an emergency physician where 
we're generalists. You know, we see a lot of uh, different types of patients and I've always had a lot of different interests. And one of the things we mentioned at the beginning is I'm an educator and specifically I, I do something called um, medical simulation, which is using mannequins and other um, machines to teach doctors um, how to take care of patients, do procedures and exams. And I was thinking like, I do all these different things. Like, how is it all related? What's the through line? And the through line is I care about doctors. Um, and I truly believe that by taking care of doctors, we take care of patients. So my education work is centered on increasing um, competency among physicians and competency is actually tied to well-being. You know, we can't feel good about the work we're doing if we don't have the expertise. And so medical simulation, you know, later today, I'll be heading to my simulation lab is a place where doctors can learn and um, practice, re, um, rebuild their skills, all, all of that. So that's one thing that I do. Um, I teach in the emergency department. So every place that I work has residents. And so I spend a lot of time um, teaching and I spend a lot of time role modeling, you know, at this point, um, you know, last night I had um, a patient, if you can believe this right before this interview, um, she told my resident, uh, who is also a, a, a woman, um, you don't look like a doctor, <laughs> which is something we, we still hear, which, you know, my reply is always, well, what, what does a doctor um, look like? And then when I went in to talk with her later, um, she said, what is with this place? Why are there so many women doctors here? And that also caused me to laugh because two, two women doctors got, you know, that's a lot. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so to answer your question, you know, I feel like a lot of what I do at this point is centered on trying to be that support to the doctors around me. And yes, the patients are at the center of what I do. Um, but I truly believe by supporting the physicians, increasing their um, well-being, teaching them that there's ways in which they can have more agency, that they can um, improve their leadership to be at the tables that we need to be having these conversations is serving my patients. Definitely. Yeah. Andrea, so what do you feel are your challenges in trying to get that message across? Ooh, um, there are a lot. Um, I think one challenge is honestly pulling our physician colleagues um, out of a feeling of reduced agency. There's this mm -hmm. phenomenon, and sometimes people get upset when I say it, of learned helplessness. The truth is, if doctors didn't show up to work tomorrow, the system would collapse. Yeah, Physicians are incredibly important in the system. They're not the most important. I mean, the system requires nurses, clerks, all sorts of people, but we're very important. Yeah. And we have to recognize that that we do have agency. You know, I hear doctors all the time, well, there's just nothing I can do. This is just the way, the way it is, the insurance companies, the government, whatever it may be. And while you're on a shift or you're in your clinic, you may be faced with certain realities that are uncomfortable and that you do have to deal with. But what I'm calling more doctors to do is to join your professional um, communities, talk to lawmakers, find a way to use your voice. You know, when I started at a new hospital, there was a, a code blue committee and I walked into the room and I sat in the back. So I was a few minutes late and I was nervous, um, about being there. And I realized I was the only physician in the room and there was probably 20 or 25 nurses there. And once they realized I was there, they were over the moon, like, oh, Dr. Austin's here. And they had so many questions that they wanted my input on, even at the first meeting. Mm. So the system is made of people. 
Yeah. And a lot of people still really value physician input, but we've got to get in there. You know, one of my favorite quotes from Teddy Roosevelt is the man in the arena. You have to get in the arena and you have to get dirty and it's going to be hard and there's going to be conflict. Um, but that's what this is about. I mean, we, what we're dealing with is not okay. Um, so to have the courage to get in there and have uncomfortable conversations and then to come together as a community and support each other, um, knowing that the work is hard. Yeah. I'm so grateful that you came up with this quote because that's the one I live by. And I really try and say this all the time. You have to join the ring. You have to get into the ring and you have to make your voice heard because only then can we um, try and achieve some change. And I think often, and that's, that's definitely true for the younger people in the world, the issue seems so big that you think anyways, I won't make a difference. And that's what you were speaking about as well. Andrea, so what do you feel is your biggest achievement? What are you most proud of to date? Wow, um, I honestly think this book, um, I love to read, I love books. I hold them like very, very dear to me. And I think it's um, a huge act of vulnerability to put a book out into the world. Yeah. And while it's not fully out into the world, I've been sharing chapters here and there um, with people that I quote and the feedback you know, the response that I'm getting is really, really um, wonderful. Um, so I'm, I'm most proud of that. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited to share it with, with doctors and with nurses and with patients, with everyone. I think even though I wrote this with a doctor in mind, yeah. um, I think it will resonate with with everyone, because the truth is we all interact with healthcare, you know, in some ways, I feel like I became a doctor to protect myself from having to interact with the system. But the truth is, we will all at some point have to go to the doctor. And um, I, I want the system to be safer for all of us. Yeah, what a beautiful mission. What a powerful vision. So what qualities do you feel that serve you every day and how do you think has this bigger purpose helped you in overcoming um yourself feeling burnt out by the system 100 percent, 100 percent. and the byline of the book is rediscovering your heartline while doctoring. And the word heartline actually um, refers to the longest horizontal line on your palm. And it's not that I um, subscribe to palm reading, but it's a metaphor that that heartline represents our emotional well being. And my superpower is really I am an empath and I feel things very strongly. And on one hand, they tell doctors, you're supposed to be empathetic, have that empathy with your patients. But what the neuroscience teaches us is that empathy, when we're sitting in empathy with someone actually activates the pain receptors in our brain, mm. where compassion, empathy plus an action activates the dopamine and reward center of our brain. Mm -hmm. So something very simple like that, if we trained people when they entered medical school that, you know, we do want people with empathy, but you have to teach them. It's like a superpower, you know, all the great superpower um, movies and cartoons. When you have a young superhero, they have to teach them how to use it um, because it's a powerful skill. Empathy is a powerful skill. And what I learned after 10 years um, is that I, my cup, my cup was empty. I didn't know how to use empathy in a way that could keep me practicing medicine. So learning that compassion, empathy plus an action, which could be as simple as listening to your patient. And then what Brene Brown says, the most compassionate people have the highest boundaries. Yeah. And boundaries show up in all sorts of ways, right? You know, during the pandemic, um, sometimes I would stand outside a patient's room if they were well enough. And I would say, could you please put your mask on? 
and then enter the room after they had their mask on. You know, I didn't have to walk in there and let someone cough on me. Mm -hmm. Um, I could use my voice if they were well enough um, to put their mask on. And, And also when I talk to consultants, I've had people yell at me and I can say, I understand you're upset and that this is a challenging situation, but I'd appreciate it if you spoke to me in a collegial way. Yeah. Those skills are things that we don't teach doctors. So by the 10 years in, I was like, I I don't have anything left to give. So it was rebuilding all of that and learning ways to be compassionate and to have boundaries. Yeah. Andrea, so do you have any role models? Who are your role models? Who inspires and motivates you to keep going with this beautiful big vision and mission that you're on? Well, one of my favorite words is friendor. It's a word that I've made up, um, which is friend plus mentor. And I have a whole group of friendors, uh, a few people that I'll, I'll give shout outs to that I reference quite a bit in the book. Um, one is Cherie Johnson. Uh, she's a psychologist and physician coach in Australia. She is a phenomenal person and she is doing so much in the well-being space. Cheryl Martin, also in Australia, she's an emergency physician. She's getting her MBA right now, uh, really focused on how we can bring um, organizational health um, to medicine. So Mm -hmm. I love both of them. Uh, Risa E. Lewis, who recently came out with a book, um, Micro Skills. Risa is also a physician and podcaster. She has a podcast called Visible Voices. And Risa and I share a lot of information. We, we text a lot. Um, we, are, we don't see each other as competition. You know, we're both doctor podcasters. Um, we truly believe um, the pie is um, big enough. And the last person I'll mention is Alexis Batista. Um, she's a PhD at the Uniform Services University. I, I shared that quote with her that the pie is big enough. And she said, Andrea, there's no pie. And, and I just, I love that quote so much. And that's a very short list of um, people in my life right now that have just showed me so much support and love and broaden my horizons. Um, and I'm, I'm very thankful to have all of them in my life. Andrea, so give us some top tips. What top tips do you have for all of us? Because we are all often pushed to the limit, but especially also physicians in have, finding that heart line. That heart line, I think the only way you find your heart line is through embodiment you have to start reconnecting with yourself. And there are so many different ways to numb yourself through social media, through substances, whatever it may be. You have to feel things. And it's hard. It's really hard. Um, The work that we're doing and the emotions involved. And you have to follow it down. You know, we didn't go into burnout very much. One of the other people I've had on the podcast, um, Michelle Woolhouse, really opened my mind to burnout always felt like something to get rid of, something to get off of me. And if you follow the burnout down, if you sit with it, it's trying to teach you something. So instead of a quick fix, um, you know, instead of I'll just book another vacation, sit with it and try to follow it to what it's trying to teach you and redirect your life. Um, so those are my two things. Feel feel things, move through those emotions, and instead of resisting the hard part, follow it down because my guess is when you follow it down, it's actually going to teach you how to, to go back up and to stay up. Yeah, I'm so grateful you said that because I, I, especially with younger women that I speak to, I always think we don't show that. We don't show that we can sit with uncomfortable uh, feelings, situations and that we are fine. We, we can do the hard things. And I think that's really something that we're just talking about now, which is a very important step in the right direction. 
Andrea, so what are your plans? You're bringing out this book uh, in the autumn. What else is on the horizon for you? Well, a lot of speaking, uh, which I'm very excited about. I'll be at the American College of Emergency Physicians meeting in Las Vegas uh, at the end of September speaking on it's not burnout, it's moral injury. So I'm excited to talk about that important topic. I'm also going to be at the Women in Medicine Summit in Chicago signing copies of uh, books. So there's still time to register for that. And I'm very excited very unexpected. I will be going to Australia in November and speaking at the Sim Connect, um, Sim Reconnect conference. And I'll be sharing uh, more about uh, medical simulation and my military background. So lots of travel, uh, which I'm, it'll be my first time um, to the continent and country of Australia. Thank you so much, Andrea, for your really inspiring story, for talking about so many important things today and for really um, inspiring us to look at all the things that we really need to um, bring change to. Thank you so much for having me.